All right, so just telling Karen, this is my first time ever moderating, so you'll have to give me a little bit of a, a pass here. And, and, and of course, you know, no pressure, I have to do it uh, with, my, with my boss. So, um, so as we get started, one, I want to say, Karen, thanks for, thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. For those of you who know me, my background, I'm, I'm from Chicago, live in the area still, so this is, this is, this is home. Uh, so it's great to have Karen you know, come here and, and, and address this group. So I'll, I'll start out with some easy ones, Karen, some, some rapid fire ones. So first off, what was your first job? Oh, my first job. My first job was um, a cashier at a grocery store, and the grocery store was called the B Big Y, and we always called it the Big How Come. And just to give you a <laughs> sense into my psyche, uh, you know, this was way back when, um, when you had cash registers that you actually had to, you know, punch the numbers in. And it wasn't scanning. And I used to always like sign up for the 10 or less because I wanted to see every day whether or not I could beat my time and the number of um, <laughs> groceries that went through my line. Um, so I was constantly competing against myself, but that's sort of what I did. <laughs> we'll get to a question later about what made Karen successful, but I think we might have already answered that at this point. Um, so other than doing you know, mo moderated talks for big groups, how do you recharge? So. Um, for those of you who heard me speak before, I'm a big um, Peloton fanatic, so I'm up every morning. I'm doing either the Peloton um, bike or the Peloton tread, and I now have um, found a new uh, thing that I'm doing. Um, it, I call it rocking, so I don't know if any of you are familiar. That's like the newest thing, the newest fitness craze, where you put a weighted backpack on your back and you kind of walk, or people run, I walk with my dog. Um, so those are some of the ways. And then um, for my mental agility, every morning I get up and I, before I even get out of bed to exercise, I do Wordle. And now I do um, New York Times connections, where you have to like take categories and put them in the categories. And, and at night, much to my husband's chagrin, um, I, I'm learning Polish. And so, like every night, you know, I'm like, you know, have it on loud. He's like, can't you just turn that down? I'm like, well, if I'm learning Polish, you could too. He's like, I'm not interested. <laughs> so, Karen, important question. So, when you do the rucking, can you get the blue dot for Peloton? Yes, because I have it on the okay. um, the walking for so. I, when I first met Mike, we talked about sort of our exercise habits, and I said, I'm obsessed with getting that little blue dot on Peloton. So every, every time you work out on Peloton, you get a, a blue dot. And I'm like 189 weeks of blue dots. So I can attest, I didn't believe it's like, kind of like, really? And she's like, here it is, every day, <laughs> blue dots. Uh, mine, not as many blue dots. But anyways. Um, so let's talk about, let's, let's, let's take this fitness thing. Let's talk about sports a little bit. Um, and so I, I want to warn you, Karen, I told you I was going to change up in a little bit. Yeah. So this is the portion I may do that. Because um, there are right answers to these questions. Uh-oh. <laughs> so, so question number one, what is the greatest baseball stadium in the country? Fenway. <laughs> uh, you knew that I was going to answer that. Oh for 1, Ruby Field. <laughs> All right, so we're, we're, down, we're down one. Okay. Um, Question number two, what is the greatest uh, NFL football team of all time? The Patriots. What year? <laughs> all the years except for this one. Okay. <laughs> also wrong, the correct answer was the 1985 Bears. <laughs> all right, there we go. Okay, so. You had some Bears fans in here. Yeah, I mean, Super Bowl shuffle, come on now. <laughs> no. But okay, we, um, so we're, we're, we're struggling with the questions here. Yeah, Karen. we are, yeah. Um, we'll, we'll I'm go, failing visibly we'll go, in we'll Chicago. Go, we'll go. I, I should have known the answers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I served up with a platter for you, you know. Uh, for sure. Could have made, you could have impressed everyone. Uh, number, number three, uh, what is the, the, the best college football team out there? Boston College. <laughs> you know, <laughs> You picked a Catholic school, which I appreciate, but it's actually Notre Dame was the correct answer. So, okay, we're, we're um, this was, uh, um, that's not really Chicago, I'm just a Notre Dame grad, so I'm biased. Okay, well, we're 0 for 3 on the questions. Um, maybe we should move on to some more that's substantive good topics idea. here, yeah. Um, okay, uh, Karen, tell me about your long term vision for CVS. Yeah, so, um, you know, when I took over in 2021, you know, we took a step back at CVS to really look at what was going on um, in sort of the world around us. And if you think, I, you know, I, I really firmly believe that the, the next several years will have more dramatic change than the last 50 
when it comes to kind of anything uh, in our industry. You just look at sort of what's going on around us. You're seeing a, um, an extensive change in the demographics of the American population. You're seeing, um, you know, the, I, I call it the tsunami of the aging population. There's more people between ages 50 and 64 than there are over 64 years old. So just imagine the incredible pressure that um, will come into the healthcare system as a result of that aging population. IBM says every day we have two and a half quintillion bits of data being processed throughout the entire um, US. And um, you, uh, you know, by 2030, you're going to see over 30 billion devices connected um, to the internet. So just imagine sort of that rate of change. So as we looked at our company and we looked at consumer behaviors, you know, we said we we're really going to move from um, a retail kind of, you know, because we were, you know, steeped in retail. Uh, you know, CVS stands for consumer value stores. We wanted to really keep sort of that consumer and that value. Um, and we decided that we were really going to move into um, being a broader health solutions company. And what we are, we're intending to do is meet customers along their continuum of their healthcare journey. So if you think about um, when someone's thinking about their health, the first thing they always ask themselves is, how, do, how am I gonna pay for that? Like, how do I afford that? And so as a company, you know, we have sort of the financing mechanisms through our Aetna business, through our Caremark business. The second question people often ask in healthcare is, where do I go to get my care? And you know, as a company, we were in the care delivery through um, our minute clinics, providing prescriptions every day as part of you know, kind of the healthcare system. And we said we really needed to sort of expand. I'll come back to that in a minute. And then we said, you know, people think, well, what do I, after care? Like, what do I do after care? And, you know, obviously getting your prescriptions, getting, um, you know, getting kind of um, products to help you with your health and well-being. We actually have everything along the continuum of someone's health. But as we looked at it, we said, it is incredibly hard. I think every single person in this room has interacted with the healthcare system and is incredibly hard. And so as we think about where healthcare is going, I firmly believe there's two things that are gonna drive healthcare. One is value-based care, where we're really going to move from sort of transactional-based to really improvement in quality and outcomes. And then everything will be powered by technology. And as a company, we, you know, as we watch consumer behaviors change, particularly through the pandemic, and as we watch sort of the, um, how are people accessing care, only one in three Americans uh, have a primary care physician today. So, it, you know, enter Oak Street Health. Think about aging population, access to primary care, uh, we decided we really wanted to enter into overall health services. So we acquired Oak Street Health. And I, I will tell you, when I went and visited Oak Street Health in one of their clinics, uh, I was sold immediately. Mike, Mike, you know, I said, Mike, I'll meet you. There's actually Oak Street Clinic next to our corporate headquarters. Mike wasn't even worried about prepping the team for a visit. He's like, I'm going to show up. I know how they're going to operate. And um, you know, one of my big passions is getting access, you know, making sure people have access to care. Well, I walked into an Oak Street clinic, and one, there was a, a van helping kind of with that transportation, getting people to the care they needed. Then um, sort of the technology and sort of the data platform that Oak Street had was um, you know, incredibly insightful to care for patients. But what was really sort of struck me was when I went into their community center, and as you likely all know, um, you know, seniors are suffering from um, social isolation and loneliness. And there was a woman in the community center that I asked her, I said, you know, what are you doing? You know, and she's like, I come here every day. This is my outlet, this is where I get to 
um, you know, meet people and talk to people. And she was actually doing decorations um, for the community center. And I thought, this, this is what healthcare is. You know, Mike has, and his team, have done an incredible job of reimagining the healthcare experience. And it's more of, it's being in the community. It's having data and information available to you. It's having that community connectedness. And it really is all about having, everyone should have access to care. And that's really what Oak Street has done. The other thing that um, is happening in healthcare is more and more people, because of the pandemic, um, are more and more comfortable having access to healthcare in their home. And so we bought another company called Signify Health, which is today, you know, goes into the home and does health risk assessments. Our whole purpose is to, when we're in the home, is to return people to care. So when they walk into the home, they're able to meet with your loved one and have a conversation about your pharmacy. You know, they actually walk around the house and pull all the uh, medications. They do a pharmacy reconciliation in the home. They do tests in the home. And then they talk about what is sort of the next thing. And so they have the opportunity to refer them to primary care, um, for uh, example, and, um, and then do follow-up care. So, and all of this is under sort of the value-based uh, approach, where we're really focusing on value, not activity. Because the value of healthcare is improving health, improving quality, and, and improving affordability. And that's really what we're trying to accomplish. So we have a very ambitious and bold agenda. Um, and I firmly believe that we have all the assets available so that we can connect. It, it, our strategy comes down to one simple thing. We're connecting the dots for people in their healthcare journey. And that's what we're attempting to do. And we're doing it through the power of technology and helping people navigate. Now, will we get there overnight? No, this is a long-term strategy. But if you look at the world today and you look at the American healthcare system, without radical change of the American healthcare system, it will collapse upon its own weight, given what I just said about what's happening with the demographics and the push on the American healthcare system. So that's what we're really attempting to do um, at CVS Health. It's um, a bold and ambitious agenda, but it, it is something that I believe that we can really achieve and we can really improve the affordability, the access, and the quality of health for all Americans. So listening to that, I have a couple of thoughts. Uh, thought number one is I wish I knew how sold you were because we could have got away with the two months of due diligence we did over the holidays last year. That would have been, you know, Oh, yeah, Mike yeah. and I were on the phone a lot <laughs> yes, um, talking about, um, yeah, okay. if, you, if you read the proxy, it was, it was not done after that visit to, uh, to Woonsocket. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, the second thing, um, just, you know, hearing that vision always gets me so excited. And obviously, I was one of the, the co-founders of Oak Street, so, you know, really believe in what we're doing there. And what has been so exciting to be part of this broader organization is just the scale, right? The scale that CVS can bring, you know, with, you know, 9,000 stores and with 1,000 plus minute clinics, now with Oak Street, with Signify doing, you know, two plus million home visits a year. I mean, the numbers are huge, and that's the type of numbers and the type of scale we need to really change this for, for, for society, right? Because there's such you know, problems that we need to take on. It's gonna collapse, uh, to your point. Um, you know, one of the things, Karen, I've heard you talk a lot about, I'd love to hear you expand on. You, you talked about you know, value-based care, you talked about technology, and you know, obviously we heard about Oak Street and Signify and the value-based care, but the other you know, side of it is the technology, and I know, um, you know you have become now an expert in all things AI, so I'd love to, I'd love to hear about your view on you know, how that fits into you know, healthcare. Well, I think, you know, it's important, um, you know, I think artificial intelligence, if you think about um, what's going to happen, we're in the midst of a once in a generation um, transformation of technology uh, in healthcare. It really is a, an opportunity to um, sort of recreate uh, how people interact with the healthcare system. And, uh, you know, one of the, every, and it's on everybody's mind, 
but one of the things that I'm most passionate about with the uh, advent of artificial intelligence it, and I always call it sort of we have to be, have responsible artificial intelligence. And I'm a big proponent of thinking about it with kind of three Ps, you know, protection, um, personalization, and powerful. And, you know, when it comes to sort of the personalization point, you know, this artificial intelligence, you can really have personalized anything but personalized healthcare, but you have to protect the privacy. And, and I think that's really critically important as we think about technology and this technology as it advances in the future. Um, it, you know, the kind of the protection um, piece of it and the personalization piece of it is, uh, or the productive piece of it, is really about it can create productivity. It can bring new tools so that you can use less manual intervention. We're actually using it in our business today where we're using it to take away some of the manual activity and putting real information on our nurses' um, desktops so that they can, so they're not fumbling around at anything and they have real information. So that it is a good productivity tool. Um, and, and the third thing is just kind of, it can be really powerful, but you have to use the power of it for the good. And I'm, you know, I, I think about this a lot because technology, as I said earlier, is the future of healthcare, but we have to use it in a responsible way. As leaders, we all need to be incredibly thoughtful of how to protect um, but support the um, advent of this once in a generation lifetime of you know, a technology revolution. Look, switching gears a little bit, um, you talked to us a little bit, I'd love you to expound, just, you know, how do you think about the impact that uh, CVS can make and um, how it can take on some of the challenges with, you know, with, with health equity and some of those aspects? Yeah, I think it's um, really important um, that everyone has kind of access, everyone, it's, it's, everyone should have access to healthcare. And today that's not the reality. Uh, unfortunately, and you know, I think you know part of my passion uh, around being in healthcare um, is I lost my mom to suicide when I was 12, and then my um, aunt, who brought in the four of us, um, you know, was um, died of uh, she smoked like uh, a pack of cigarettes a day, so she had lung cancer, she had breast cancer, and I remember being sort of in the hospital room, um, sitting on her bed, not knowing what questions to ask not knowing sort of what, um, you know, where to go and where to help her. And so, and, and as a child, you know, kind of growing up, you know, we didn't really have a lot of access to healthcare. And so I'm very passionate about making sure that everyone has sort of a, uh, that just, you know, appropriate access to healthcare. And as a company, we're incredibly committed to uh, making sure that health equity is at the forefront of what we do. And you just look at the statistics. You know, um, you know uh, black uh, uh, people ha are 50% likely to have um, heart disease versus 35% of whites. Hispanic women are more likely, twice as likely, to have diabetes than a, than a white woman. And people who live in rural America are more likely to have disease or death than the average person who lives in an urban setting. Those statistics should be a call to action to all of us in this room to make sure that people have um, access to equitable health care. And it all starts with the, the leadership of each and every single one of us. And you know, one, a couple things that you know, we do is um, you know, here in Chicago, uh, we have um, recently given a grant to uh, the local children's hospital where we have a mobile unit um, to support uh, access to health. We also recently um, have a partnership with the Community Alliance where we are supporting um, the hiring of community uh, professionals. And then recently we've done about uh, 50 what we call project health events where we bring in 
our own mobile unit to underserved uh, communities where we do active screenings um, for those underserved individuals. And then we provide them guidance on how to return, um, you know, return to care. And the other thing we do is we have, uh, you know, you, you, don't, you, you can't think about your health if you don't have um, a, a job. And so we have um, workforce training centers. We have about seven or eight of them across the US where um, we go into um, cities and we work with community partners and we do training programs uh, for uh, individuals so that they, we can train them so that they can get jobs. We start, um, you know, we'll start with CVS and we'll train them how to use ca uh, cash registers and we'll train them in customer service. And if we hire them, uh, and we try to hire them, if not, we try to help place them in the communities because if people aren't access, if people don't have their jobs, they're not gonna think about health. So it is something that is part of um, our core pillar of what we do as a company. And, um, what's, what I'm most fortunate about is I have a management team that every single one of us has a story and has a passion about what we're trying to do in healthcare. And, and equitable access to healthcare is core to everything um, that we do at CBS Health. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate you building on that, Karen. And I think it's one of the most exciting things is when we became part of CBS, you're, you know, you're nervous, and I think. I can, I'm looking at the Oak Street table here. You know, we love our mission, and we really believe in the impact we're making, and it was so refreshing when we became out of this big company, we were nervous, to find that that mission was so shared by all the leaders, so it's been, it's been a great, great experience so far. Uh, I, I wanna switch gears a little bit um, and talk you know, more about, about you, and uh, tell me about your leadership philosophy. Yeah, so um, my leadership philosophy. Keep um, in mind, I, I'm, I'm right here. I can, I can call you out on things. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, one of the things um, my team and I did uh, early on in my tenure as CEO is we went to um, West Point and we did a leadership program. And one of the things that we talked a lot about is what is your leadership philosophy and, and how do you lead? And, uh, and I shared that my leadership philosophy with, the, with my management team, and then each of them shared their leadership philosophies with their respective organizations. And, and really, mine comes down to a couple things. It's about, all about integrity. It's all about respect. It's all about authenticity. And it's about accountability. And, um, and then I'm very focused on empathy, uh, because as a company, we interact with people when they are sort of there at their most vulnerable point. Um, because as you all know, health is your most valuable asset. And you're only interacting with us most of the time when something is wrong with you um, from a health perspective. You know, you're calling up Aetna, you know, asking about, um, you know, where do I get, you know, what, what are the best doctors for my, my cancer? Or you're walking into a minute clinic um, because you might have the flu. Or you're going to Oak Street because, um, you know, you have a number of, um, you know, you're going to see primary care, but the conditions at Oak Street, I think like seven, most on average, they have seven different mm -hmm. um, conditions. So. Uh, or going into people's homes. So I, I'm a big proponent about kind of empathetic leadership because of what we do every day, um, because we're interacting. And I, as I stand up and talk to our colleagues, I always remind them that what we do and how we interact with our customers, our patients, uh, and, and our colleagues is don't forget that that could be your mother, your father, your sister, your friend. And let's not lose sight of that because that's who I want our company to be, and that's how I want to inter how, well, I, how I want us to interact with people. Now, does that always happen? No, it doesn't, because I do see a lot of complaints. Um, but that's what we really um, strive to do as a company, and that's sort of what my, my overall uh, leadership philosophy. You know, it's interesting. One of the things that I learned at this uh, at this West Point thing was um, I was kind of wondering, like. How come, like, they aren't telling me that something like major was happening? Like, you know, I find out later. And one of the things that you know I learned was um, I never actually shared with my team what my wake-up criteria was. And so that was something else I learned at this thing. I'm like, 
you know, and I call it my wake-up criteria, and I have like eight things that I've shared with my team and the organization. If any one of these eight things happen, I want you to call me. So, um, and that, that way I'm not sort of hearing it, um, you know, in the newspaper or, you know, re <laughs> reading about it. And, and, and but was it, you know, kind of, one of the things that I sort of, my leadership philosophy sort of is, I'm a constant learner. And so, you know, it, just because I'm the CEO of CBS Health, I can still learn. And I think it's an important part of any leadership, uh, you know, is to sort of continual learning. I actually have a reverse mentor. I have a young woman, 23 years old, that I meet with on a quarterly basis that she kind of shares insights with me. Um, you know, when we were doing um, COVID shots and kind of educating people about their vaccines, uh, she's like, Karen, you should do it on TikTok. I'm like, TikTok? I'm like, really? <laughs> and we got over 3 billion views on TikTok on our vaccines. So had I not had that conversation with her, I'm not sure I would have really sort of pushed the marketing organization to do something different. So, you know, part of that sort of leadership ethos for me is, um, you know, constantly, you know, be open. You know, I, you know, just, you know just because... I'm over 60 and I have a lot of experience, doesn't mean that I can't continue um, to learn. So I, I share that with you because I think it's an important leadership lesson. Hopefully I don't have to leverage any of those wake you up moments, but so, so far <laughs> so good. Um, last question, I tease this, and I, and I say this, you know, kind of come back to our, our earlier questions on sports. We are, we are in the city of Three Peats here in <laughs> Chicago, and I, I want to point out, for those of you who don't know, you know uh, Karen has a Three Peter, she is the now three-time uh, Women, most Powerful Woman in Business Award winner, three years in a row now, um, which is impressive. <laughs> and so I figured uh, I'd kind of end with the question I tease, which is, um, you know, what has made you so successful? Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's partly that. I think it, first of all, I would say I've had phenomenal people that I've worked with my entire career. I have had great uh, leadership teams, you included. I've got um, some you know, people I've worked with um, before. I've been fortunate to have an incredible uh, leadership team. I have a wonderful husband who has been a um, supporter of mine, and I couldn't have um, done it without him, uh, without him. And I think it's that sort of um, competitive spirit and and you know when you get knocked down, getting up to fight because I've been knocked down a lot, and I just kept kept getting up and getting ready to fight. You know when I was, and I, I love to share this story. Um, when I was um, you know in line for a, a big important job, um, I had to go through. When when you're going for these, you know, in corporate America, you all know you sometimes have to go through this. Like you go through 360 feedback, you go through. Um, testing, you go through a lot of different things. And um, I got the, you know, I sat down with the consultant, and it was a, a gentleman and a, and a woman to get all that feedback. And sat down, and the guy looks at me and goes, Hey, listen, your leadership number's off the charts, never seen anything like it. But you don't look the part. He's like, You're blonde, you're short, you're petite, and your voice isn't deep enough. And I'm like, Well, I'm blonde, I dye my hair that way, I kind of like it. Um, I'm 5'4", impossible, impossible for me to grow any taller. Um, I can wear heels. Um, my voice isn't deep enough. Oh, sure, sure, okay. Um, I'll go take voice lessons. That's a great idea. So I went to voice lessons. I went to, I did, I did, I, I, I did. So I went to this and I called my husband. Hello. <laughs> this is my voice. I'm speaking from my diaphragm. He's like, Karen, just come home. You don't need the job. Like, I mean, if you can't work in an organization that doesn't respect who you are and your authentic you, go find someplace else. And I share that sort of what makes you successful. It's sort of like I was down. I got up and fought. I got the job. But you got to fight through some of those things because, you know, no matter what, people are going to kind of, you know, push. And, um, and everyone has an opinion, you know all this, everyone has an opinion. 
And you just got to keep fighting. And I think that's what has made me incredible, incredibly successful, in addition, as I said, to having a phenomenal um, teams and phenomenal support system around me. Great. Well, look, appreciate you sharing that. And uh, thank, thank you again for, for being here. I really, really appreciate you coming to Chicago and taking the time for everyone. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me.